and welcome to today's segment of The Power of Money. I'm your host, Michelle Graves, nationally and internationally known as The Money Lady. And as always, I'm delighted to have you be a part of my world for the next hour. And it's going to be an absolutely extraordinary hour. I encourage you to sit down, put down, whatever you're doing, just stop and, and, and take a breather because I have an extraordinary guest on my show and we're going to be talking about an, an area that is so very, very timely. So again, I welcome you, and without further ado, I am going to introduce you to my guest, and we're going to be talking about a very vital subject to enable you to understand the changes and the shifts that are taking place in our American culture. As I said on an earlier broadcast, 2013 is the perfect storm. A lot of things are happening. Things will never be the, ch the same. And maybe the Mayans had it right when they said that December 21st of 2012 was the end of the world. The world may not have ended physically, but I do absolutely believe that the world has changed fundamentally and we're not ever going to be the same or even look the same. So with that uh, background, I'm going to introduce my next guest, and he is going to enlighten you on his world. So, Mr. Ortiz, nice to have you here today. Thank you. Where do we want to begin? Let's begin by introducing you to uh, my viewers and giving them a little bit of information and background about who you are and uh, your background. Okay. Well, I can start from the beginning where my parents were um, born, you know, okay. born in Puerto Rico and okay. recruited to Ohio, up near Lorain, Ohio, okay. to um, work in the factories, well, my dad in particular. Okay. Um, but basically, they were brought there to work and along with a lot of other Puerto Ricans out of, because they had a lot of jobs and needed some people that were hardworking and mm -hmm. weren't afraid to work, and they started there. Okay. Then Lorain, Korea basically became a very big Latino community. Okay? Really? Yes, there were more okay. Puerto Ricans there at the time when I was growing up, second only to, or third to Chicago and uh, New York. New York. Mm. There was a lot of Puerto Ricans there, and then gradually there were also Mexicans that moved in as well. Uh, okay. But that, they pretty much came at about the same time. But they were there to work. They came there for the jobs. Okay? And growing up, I went to typical public schools. Okay? Um, had my share of good teachers, but also had my share of poor teachers, okay? Um, also, growing up, we didn't have the support. Um, at, well, basically, my parents had no knowledge of what I was doing in school because both of them um, went as far as the third or fourth grade when they were in Puerto Rico, and that's as far as that's the most education they were. They went through when I was growing up. But as I, as I grew, as I went through the system, okay, and then I went on, um, I went to a community college, uh, thank to a, uh, thankful to a, a, a counselor, okay, his name was Saul Torres, who helped me get to the process. I had no idea, okay, I, I didn't even think about college until he spoke to me, okay, and he got me through the process the two years at the community college, and then I went from there to Bowling Green. Okay. okay. And luckily at Bowling Green, I, w I found a supportive group there as well. Okay. Wonderful. There was a Latino um, student group and also some Latino mentors that were there that helped me through the process when I was there. Because when I got there, I was homesick. Okay? Oh, yeah. Because I was one of 13 kids growing that up. That were Latino? At, at home. Okay. Um, oh, at, you were one I, of 13? Yeah, one of 13 oh, kids. Oh, my goodness. Your parents had 13 children. Yeah. And I okay. was... Okay. All yeah. right. And I was used to being around a lot of people and when I got to Bowling Green. I mean, I felt... Isolated, yes. but then I found other Latino friends that were there and that helped me get through that process. Excellent. Okay, I finished school there. Okay, and then I went on and uh, and my degrees were in athletic training. Okay, um, and also education, okay? mm -hmm. Spanish education. But then I went back to, to Lorraine. Okay? okay, and I worked for an agency there. We started a tutoring program and um, I taught there for a year. And then I also spent some time with the Philadelphia Eagles in the NFL doing an internship. Okay. Again, through the help of a former teacher who knew the athletic trainer there, helped me get through that. Then I went back to Bowling Green and got my master's 
again, in athletic training. I had a graduate assistantship where I was worked in the sports medicine area. Mm -hmm. Also taught and took my classes. And then back in 1980, I came to Beaver Creek High School, okay. where I was a Spanish teacher. Okay, and then I also was um, uh, at that time the athletic trainer as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, there is where I really learned the difference of education. I had no idea what I didn't know. Okay, going up, going through school, you know, I, like I said, the schools were okay, mm -hmm. but when I got the Beaver Creek, I saw what schools were supposed to be like. Okay. That's an excellent school system. Yes, yes. I, I didn't realize, <laughs> mm -hmm. okay, that you had all these teachers that were committed, that had the passion to teach. But I also saw on the other end, though, too, that parents were fully engaged in the education of their, of their kids. Okay? Uh, that's when I saw, that opened up my eyes and said, boy, this is what it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. okay? um, and it changed because, uh, again, the previous schools that, were, that, that I was at, it wasn't like that. Okay. I remember having an English teacher who was a city councilman at the time. He ran his election during our class. We didn't get any kind of instruction there. I remember a plumber, a history, was a, a history teacher who was a plumber who worked all night and came and felt, went to sleep in our class. That's the kind of stuff that I remember and I said, mm. and I know when I got to Beaver Creek, that was not, that didn't occur. I didn't see that, mm. okay? Positive and I'm sure. teachers and parents. Yes, you know, I really know. believe that. Mm -hmm. um, teacher, once they lose their passion, they lose their interest, they really need to get out because they're doing more harm than good. I, but I also that. believe as well that teachers should be paid top dollar. You pay that top dollar, you're going to attract good students to become teachers. And that is such an important uh, position, I believe. Understandably okay. so. I absolutely agree with you that teachers should be um, um, they should be paid well. Good teachers deserve the mm -hmm. top salaries. Yeah, bad you, teachers really don't need to be in the system. Yeah, if you look at the mm -hmm. best systems in education okay. in, the, in the world, okay, all of them have one thing in common. They all pay their teachers and they all have respect for their teachers as they should be. Now okay. what about parental involvement? Parental involvement as well. I think it's key. But you know, like my parents, they had no idea when I went to school, okay, what I was doing. Mm -hmm. they never went through that process mm -hmm. nor did they speak English to be able to communicate with the teachers right so when the teacher would call the house you know and talk about how I was doing I was the interpreter so I always told them hey everything was going great <laughs> <laughs> but you know good. the same thing happens you know a lot of Latino households okay the kids become the interpreters and they are the they basically communicate between the teacher between the teacher and the parents Okay. Interesting. So and let's fast forward to where you are now. So okay. you went through Beaver Creek. I went through Beaver Creek and then in back and, and I taught Spanish and was okay. the athletic trainer. Okay. But then I went to Wright State, okay, in 1985. Okay. Okay. Um, as the athletic trainer. Okay. okay. I started the uh, sports medicine program there in 85 from the ground. My uh, goodness gracious. So That's I've been amazing. involved in teaching and health care for the last 35 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. But yeah, I developed that program, and then about five years ago, I was traveling men's, with the men's basketball team all over the, I've been in all 50 states, I've been all over the place. Mm -hmm. But uh, I gave that up because I really wanted to do more in the Latino community, okay? Good for you. And as I mm -hmm. gave that up, that the uh, service side, okay? okay? I'm still doing the teaching, okay? But when I gave up the service side, my hours went from 80 down to about 40, mm -hmm. okay? okay? But then I was able to do more in the community. Yes. Okay? Okay? And then at that time, I knew, being here from 1980, okay, that there was, um, there was a lot of Latinos that were scattered all over the, what I call the footprint of Dayton area, all the counties that touch Montgomery County, mm -hmm. okay? There's a lot of Latinos out there, okay? And there's a lot of different groups. Okay. So about uh, four years ago, I brought all those leaders together of all those organizations, and we created the Latino Dream Team, okay? The Latino Dream, Dream team. team. Yes. Wow. And with the help of one of our vice presidents at the university, okay, a couple of them, mm -hmm. okay, they basically helped me get it started. And to this day, it's still in existence, and basically we tackle issues. We are very proactive in the, with the community on trying to create programming, okay, or identify issues and trying to uh, come up with remedies for those problems. So what is the vision of this dream team? Dream team is to elevate the level of education, level of living, okay, for the Latino community in the surrounding area. 
Okay. Awesome. Okay. And you birthed that. Yes. That's your along, baby. Along with a few others. Oh, of course. The yes. team is always important. Oh, yeah. But you always have to have somebody that sees the vision. All right. And then pulls together a team. Yeah, and then about a year ago, um, about a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. um, I was named a commissioner in the Ohio Commission of Hispanic and Latino Affairs. Okay. okay. That's appointment by the governor. Okay. Okay. Governor Kasich, Kasich yeah. was um, very, um, he names all the members of that of the, when they're open spots now, he basically names the mm -hmm. commissioners. And one of the first things they asked me to do was to head the education committee. Okay, My and goodness. that's when I said, you know, I definitely would be very interested in doing that. Okay? okay, aside from you know, I, I get asked to do a lot of things, but if it doesn't have to do with healthcare deliver healthcare and delivery system or education, I won't do it. Right. Okay? So okay. you're clear about your lane. I'm clear on exactly yeah. what I want to do. Mm -hmm. But if it's about elevating the Latino community in any way, okay, whether it's education, health care, or business, I will help any way I can there. That's powerful. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, as a commissioner, I, I know that there are some, you know, like I told you, a lot of eyes were opened up when I got to Beaver Creek High School. I didn't know what I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Now that I know what I do know, mm -hmm. I know that we can make a difference. Okay. Absolutely, and the and the Latino community is, um, as I call it, the emergent community, mm -hmm. and and it's and and your time is here. It's not yes. coming. It's mm -hmm. it's it's officially here. Yeah. We saw it in the presidential elections. It had been coming, but now it is visibly, measurably here. Mm -hmm. But along with that emergent, so to speak, are all of the challenges that go along with that. So I'd like you to speak to that since you're in a position yeah. to talk about that. You know, I truly believe that we need to do for ourselves. No one's going to come in and help us through this process if we don't try to help ourselves. Okay. But once we create okay, the infrastructure within the different groups, okay, um, there will be other people that will step up. Okay, and help us through the process. Now what does this infrastructure look like? Okay, Tony? I'll give you an example. Okay. okay? Um, about four years ago as well, part of the Latino Dream Team, mm -hmm. we created El Puente Learning Center, okay. which is located in the east end of Dayton at St. Mary's Church at the Hispanic Catholic Ministry. Okay. Okay? I basically wrote grants, okay? and it's all privately funded. We had the third floor of their um, a former Catholic school that they mm -hmm. had there. Okay? And within it, okay, I basically had tutors from University of from Wright State University, mm -hmm. from our service learning classes, students from University of Dayton, okay, and also parents that are involved and other community volunteers. And it's an after school tutoring program and we started off with just K through six. Okay. Okay, which is El Puente for little kids. Okay. Then I got another grant through um, uh, Four Driving Dreams. Mm -hmm. And it's for, it was basically these kids got up to sixth grade and they wanted to stay in the program. Mm -hmm. So we created a dropout prevention program. Okay? okay. And we identify the kids that have the most needs and those are the ones that are invited to participate in the program. Okay. okay? We just it's just not for everybody it's basically for those who have the most needs and we're trying to basically uh, narrow that achievement gap and trying to help those kids get through. Okay. Okay, we know if we get them over a certain hurdle, okay, then we know if we get them to the ninth grade, okay, the chances of them going to be successful are going to be much higher. Okay. And that's through this support system. Do you mm -hmm. see the school as a support ve vehicle yeah. for the children? We're all partners. Okay. okay. Our College of Education at Wright State is a partner. Okay. LULAC, which is the League of United Latin American mm -hmm. Citizens, mm -hmm. they provide the computers. Okay. Um, Dayton Public Schools, okay, identify who these individuals are. And then all the other schools in the area are also part of it as well. Not only the public schools, but the parochial and charter schools also. Um, send us kids as well. My goodness, so how did the word get out? Was it just through uh, the church? Through the church. You know, my, my partner in crime out there, Sister Maria. You okay. Know. Okay, Sister Maria, and then there's also another lady named Rosa Kasky. It was basically Rosa Kasky from LULAC, okay, mm -hmm. Sister Maria from the Hispanic Catholic Ministry, and myself, we got it started, okay? Three people with and a then, vision. Yeah, and, awesome. then, and then we basically have hired um, some folks to run each of the programs. Yes, right. And it's been sustainable. Okay. Now, how many years has this, this school this been going This is uh, fourth year. Fourth year. Fourth year. So are you now seeing um, 
are you seeing the fruits with, with oh, young yes. people oh, yes. making transition? Talk about that. Two of them, okay. The first valedictorian, okay, uh, first Latino valedictorian who was an immigrant, okay, um, was one of our kids at Belmont High School. Oh, my goodness. And a female? Three, a guy. A guy? A guy. Okay. All right. And he, when he first got here, he didn't speak a lick of English. Where right? was he from? Mexico. He's from Mexico? Okay. okay. So, and then another, we had like a third grade mm -hmm. a young girl um, became the spelling bee champ for her school. Okay. And again, these kids didn't speak a lick of English when they, when first, they first got, got here. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that we've seen, and which is really neat, is um, the involvement of the service learning kids from Wright State and the service learning kids from UD, mm -hmm. they have really gotten passionate about being involved. They really like doing it because mm -hmm. otherwise they wouldn't have had this opportunity. Okay, being on their campuses, okay, and not getting involved, they would not have this opportunity to mingle and to learn more about these Latino kids and the Latino culture. That's what I find so absolutely exciting to me mm -hmm. because America has always represented historically a country that offered opportunity. Mm -hmm. and that embraced people from varying cultures and backgrounds. It was mm -hmm. this melting pot, this huge human experience that I think made our country so unique in terms of what we represented. So I am very interested in what you're talking about mm -hmm. because, again, the emergent, the Latina community is, is, is a powerful force. And I'd like to, to know you all, though, your culture emphasizes um, independence yes. and self-reliance mm -hmm. and um, family support. Correct. That's a part of your yeah. culture. Yeah, and, 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 and then there's also a conflict there. Okay, okay? well let's talk I'm about trying to teach, um, okay. I'm trying to teach these kids to work smarter, okay. not harder. Okay. okay. Whereas their parents have always worked and worked and worked and worked, but you know, a lot of them don't have a lot to show because they took, they've taken on these menial jobs and mm -hmm. never have gotten that advanced education where they wouldn't have to work this hard now is if they've had that education. Mm -hmm. Where I'm trying to teach these young kids, you work hard now, okay? Right. You, don't, you don't have to be out in the farm fields and doing all that other work later. Okay. I, mean, I mean, it's necessary, but you know, I think every kid has the ability, okay? Has a certain ability and it's up to us or whoever is working with those kids to bring out that potential in that individual. Okay? Just because they grew up in a poor house doesn't mean they don't have the ability to go to go on to advanced programs. Okay? There's no you know, just because they grew up in a house where they didn't speak English does not mean that they can't take an A P course. Okay? Um, you know, just because the parents didn't have an education does not mean that they can't succeed in school, okay? Again, they have this ability and it's up to us, okay? And up to them as well, okay? Up to them as well to um, take advantage of the resources that are available, okay? You know, and that's another issue. You know, one of the other problems within the community is the um, parents don't know the process on getting their kids through through school, okay? They don't know what the process is, nor do they ever question, okay? Out of respect, because, you know, growing up, we're always we're taught to respect the elders, yes, respect yes. the teachers, never question them, mm -hmm. but sometimes they need to be questioned, okay? Right. Like you gave you the example, that English teacher who ran his campaign during my class, mm. okay? During our class, or that plumber, okay? Who worked so hard at night and slept during our class, you know, uh, our parents at that time didn't have they didn't know they can question that. Right. Okay? And I think it might be worthwhile in saying that many parents today that are not necessarily uh, Latina, mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't know about the right to challenge and question as well. There's a lack of understanding. And, there, and there's a fine line there too. Yes. Okay? You know, there's, you, you have your helicopter parents, okay? Yes. And then you have parents who are just not engaged at all. There's got to be happy medium there. They, mm -hmm. have to, they have to question what's going on in the schools. So how is that working with um, the Latino community? Well, through El Puente, we okay. not only are there to tutor and mentor these kids, okay, but if issues come up, 
okay, within a family, yes. okay, at a particular school, we see to it that that issue is addressed with so the do administrator. You intervention or how well, do you do we that? just bring it to the attention of the administrator and try okay. to work it out. Okay, that is good. So and a lot of times it's protect. just not only in the interpreter for that family, but also the advocate for that family so that they're getting what they justly deserve. I think, well, in fact, I know you're right. right. Yeah. So have you seen a shift because of that oh, yes. uh, active p participation, as I would say? Oh, yes. You know, we have pretests, and they take this hotel uh, exam when they first get started. Mm -hmm. And all those numbers have increased tremendously. That is so good. So mm -hmm. how many uh, children are involved we'll in this take, program um, right now? We'll take about 30 in the early with the early kids, and we'll take about 25 at the other kids. Okay. okay. But again, we, that's just because la the funding we had, that's all we can really afford to take. Now, do you see that being a venue to uh, move children into other social networking situations like Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts? Do you see that as a possible evolutionary path here? For sure. Okay. Because, you know, when I, when I first started the program, I said, I don't want these kids to be dependent on this program the whole time. I want it to just be a transition point. Okay. We'll get them up to a certain level where they're able to do their own work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, know what the right path is and stay on that path. Okay, mm -hmm. and then we bring in another group of kids. Okay, that is but I like path. I like your your you, I, I like your cultural perspective about work though. There is tremendous value to children seeing their parents work hard, don't you think? Yes, there is. There okay. is. But then also, you know, um, like I have a couple of friends that own a restaurant. Okay, okay? and they work and they work and they work. That's a but tough if, business. But yeah. if they had, okay, any knowledge of a business plan, any ma any knowledge of ma management of the facility, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they wouldn't have to work as hard. That's what this I'm talking true. about. Okay, Working I got you. smarter, okay, okay. Not, right. not harder. Right, right. Well, if any group can do it, it's going to be this generation coming mm -hmm. up. They are so smart, Tony. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, mean, I look at them and I'm like, <laughs> oh, yeah. I feel like an old woman. It, it's they're amazing. Smart. It's amazing. These kids, you know, um, again, they're speaking Spanish. Like myself, I taught, I spoke Spanish at home growing up, and then I learned English at school. Yes. And then I learned Spanglish along the way, too. <laughs> but then, you know, you, you basically are living in two cultures. Yes. Okay? Living in two worlds. Okay? Um, and so, you know, you have to know when to blend in and when not mm -hmm. to, you know. Never now, mind how did your parents uh, learn to speak uh, English? My dad did because he worked did. in a factory. Mm -hmm. He had to learn. Okay? okay. My mom never got a driver's license. Okay. Um, but was heavily involved in the church. Okay. And um, never did made us made made us speak Spanish all the time, which was good. Okay. Because okay? we kept our Spanish. Yes. Okay. Yes. But I always got on her because I really truly believe if you don't learn the language, you get taken advantage of. I think that's a fair assessment. In and, this culture, you definitely and can get And I truly get believe that. You know, I, I like to retain our language, but I also I, I, a big advocate of people learning the language, mm -hmm. okay? learning the culture where they're living in. Right, okay? right. You don't have to assimilate completely, but you've got to accept. You know, you're in a different place that you've got to adjust as well. Well, let, as we look at the Latino community as the emergent, as I call it, uh, which is a with um, over the coming years because America has changed fundamentally forever. For sure. It's, it's a fact. And mm -hmm. the demographers knew it. Maybe there wasn't a lot of conversation about it, but certainly um, almost 30 years ago I read a, 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 a powerful book that talked about the trends and uh, the demographics and the immigrants and the Latino community, which at that time was not sizable, but given the, um, the direction of the country, his projections were right on target. And um, the numbers said by 2020, but we're here now. Things moved a little faster because uh, the uh, Latino community encourages uh, children and lots of children. Mm -hmm. And uh, the predominant culture in America is uh, one or two children. That's it. Mm -hmm. And of course, we've got a whole generation that says no children. They don't want any. They don't want any children because they're the perpetual child. Mm -hmm. So, looking at this, what are some of the critical issues that you see during this transition? You know, in certain areas. Yes. Um, you know, you don't 
the parents don't take advantage of all the resources that they have available to them. Okay. okay. For instance, if you have a poor performing school, they don't know that they can get a voucher and go to a better school. Okay. Oh my goodness. Okay. okay. All right. Um, you know, you know, they don't know that they can question that school. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't know that they can question that teacher. They don't know. But then also on the other side though too is parents need to get their kids to school. And then this cro crosses all cultures. Yes. Okay? If the kid's not in that classroom, okay, you're not going to learn anything. Okay? But if he's there, at least going to absorb something. Okay? So you think that there's a truancy issue or that parents no, aren't some, even getting their But that's, that's in certain, certain groups, certain yes, areas. Yes. Okay? Because, you know, if a kid is going to school, okay, and I won't mention any cities, but in an urban setting, okay, and it's, they don't feel safe, they feel bully, okay? Yeah. And they don't they're not able to communicate or don't communicate that back to their parents. You know, as, you know, if the kids missing school, there's usually a reason. Yeah. Okay? okay. Either they're bored or they're bullied or they are, you know, they have other issues going on in their home. Exactly. Or they're mm -hmm. forced to work yes. by their parents because to make ends meet at the house. You know. Oh my goodness! You I know, hadn't even thought about children another, having to work. That's another issue. Yes. Yes. You know? Okay. But you know, attendance is very important. Mm -hmm. Okay, the quality of the schools that they go to. Okay, if they live in a poor district, okay, um, the chances that the schools that they're going to, if they don't get a good administrator at that school that's passionate about, you know, elevating the bar. Okay, mm -hmm. um, if you elevate the bar, it's the kids will meet it. Okay, kids want to be disciplined. Kids want to be challenged. Okay, I believe that. I'm okay? glad to hear you say um, that. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you have a school that constantly lowering the bar. Okay, and kids, you know, they take good grades home. It's not accurate. The script, uh, not, it's not a good measurement of what's actually going on in that school. Now, does that position, because actually it is a catch-22. The excellent grades out of a poor school may not be what you exactly. need to get you into a university, correct? Correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, not everybody likes to see these ACT scores, SAT mm -hmm. scores, but... But they do say something. They do say something. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I have a program that's very competitive, our athletic training program, and I take a look at those over the years, and the correlation is very high. Really? Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not only looking at that test score, but I'm also looking at the GPA. Okay. okay? If I have a kid with, a, a, let's say, a 20 ACT, mm -hmm. okay? And has like a uh, 3.5 GPA. Okay. That kid's working. Okay. But if I have a kid with a 25, okay, um, ACT score and let's say only a 2.5 at a school, I know that kid's lazy. Okay. I'm, I'm always looking at those correlations and looking at that kind of data. My I goodness. Mean, but you know, you look again. We have to raise the bar. Keep the bar high. Okay, kids want to be challenged. Kids want to be disciplined. Okay, but also that comes with the teachers as well. They need to be challenged. Yes. They need to yes. be disciplined. They need to be supportive as well. Okay, if there's an issue in the classroom and you send a kid to the office and the office does nothing about it and sends them back, okay, that teacher loses power within that classroom. I have to believe that, and mm -hmm. but we're seeing that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know, truthfully, uh, Tony. Many of my peers are leaving the educational system entirely because um, they said, I, I, I can't get any support. The children are out of control. They come to school hungry. Uh, they, they are undisciplined, unruly. They don't want to learn. And these are some high achieving uh, uh, teachers that have been teachers for many years and mm -hmm. just said, I can't take it anymore. And they're bailing out. They're retiring. They're done. And I'm very, very sorrowful to hear that because at this point in history, it's critical that we have the most talented and the best that America can bring to the table. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're competing against Chinese children, 25 million yep. and more, who are pushed to be superstars and are educated seven days a week. Uh, that's, 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 uh, that's tough. Mm -hmm. You know, today's education system in the United States has to change. Yes. Okay? These kids have different motivation, motivators, okay? You have to learn what, what motivates them and change your classroom. You can't sit there and lecture them anymore. Okay? What do they want? They want to be engaged. You know, they want to, unfortunately, they want to be entertained as well.
They want to be engaged. They want to do things that are meaningful. They want to be able to also be treated with respect. Mm -hmm. But the same thing goes the other way as well. Right. You know, teachers need the same thing. Okay? But the key is parents. You know? The parents need to be there okay? be, and do the right thing. Okay? Okay. Support the, the student. Okay? If, it's, if your kid is not doing well, okay, you need to be there to support them. Okay? And if they do, you know, if, if they basically need to be rewarded for good work, okay? and they're not doing good work, they need to be disciplined. Okay? I couldn't agree more. You know? And unfortunately, that more. doesn't always happen. Okay? The, the, teach, the parent will always defend the kid even though he did the wrong thing. Okay? You have to look at the total picture. There's always two sides of every story. You've got to listen to both sides. And you've got to be a parent. So let me ask you this question. In, your, um, in the course of your work with the uh, Latino community, mm -hmm. are you finding situations where the child is demeaned or discriminated against in a uh, learning environment? Are you encountering any kind of uh, uh, stories about that? Yes. Yeah, but okay. that's the same, you know, that's the same with anybody different within a school, whether it's a big, you know, whether it's a, if a kid's any different than the other kids in their class, that's going to happen. And okay. it does happen. Okay. Okay. But again, you have to, fa basically, that's where a teacher takes the role, okay, mm -hmm. and educates everybody on what, you know, what these differences are and mm -hmm. accept them, okay. Uh, you know, stop the bullying, stay, stop the uh, name calling, you know, address issues as they come up. Mm -hmm. Again, discipline is very key. Okay. You know, your good schools have very st stringent discipline policies. And, and boundaries. They stick to, and boundaries. And Everybody boundaries. Everybody knows. Yeah, everybody knows the rules. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you uh, do feel that in that environment, a child would have a much better chance of um, success than in, an, in a more carefree, unstructured environment. For sure. Okay. For sure. Okay. And you know, when we did with this conference we had last week was... Yeah, I want to talk about we that had, conference. We yeah. identified best practices. Okay. Uh, these best practices were nominated and selected, okay, on things that were, they were doing and they showed success. Okay? Mm -hmm. And we brought those nine presentations in, okay. We had an elevator talk on each one in the beginning, and then everybody got to pick which ones they wanted to do. We had three concurrent sessions. Okay. So let's let's backtrack because mm -hmm. I want to talk about this conference. Yeah. What was the name of the conference? It's Latino Education Summit. Latino okay. Education, Education and where Summit. was it held? At Wright State at the Nutter Center. Okay, and who were the invited guests? The invited guests, well, the two um, the two chairs with me were Senator Peggy Laner. Okay, okay. Peggy Laner, okay. and awesome Senator lady. and Senator Tavares. Okay. Okay, and again, bipartisan. Okay, we put politics aside and we. Brought, mm -hmm. brought up what needed to be done. Okay. okay. And then I had committees, uh, committee members from all over the state. Okay. All over the state. Yeah, I had committees okay. from committee members from Cleveland, Toledo, Columbus, Cincinnati. Okay. Um, and then we basically that committee selected the best practices. Okay. okay. And some of the best practices, like the Cincinnati schools. Okay. okay. They had some great program. Their superintendent came with all their administrators and did the presentation. The superintendent of Cincinnati she Schools. She came herself. Here. Yeah. Oh my goodness, that's wonderful. And then that's um, wonderful. Dayton Public School. Or no, okay. I mean, not, no, not Dayton, but uh, Springfield City Schools. Okay. Their superintendent or their group came in presented. Okay. Cleveland City Schools. They have a particular program. They've they've been very successful in retaining students. Hmm. Their dropout rate was thirty percent. Cleveland was 30%. Well, no, it was at 50% and they reduced it. Reduced to, it to, to 30%. 30. Okay. Yeah. All and right. we heard about that program, how they okay. did it, what they did. Okay. Now, um, was this focused specifically on the Latino community or the community at large? Community at large. Okay. Okay. But it doesn't, you know, basically looking at programs like that, it's going to work in the community at large or work in the Latino community as well. It should. But what we mm -hmm. did was we brought these Latino leaders and these legislators mm -hmm. and these school administrators and then after these presentations were given after lunch they sat down and we gave them a list of eight questions that they responded to and now we're compiling all that information okay to see what our next step is going to be but Are we will have this every year have you as a result of this coming together of like-minded persons mm -hmm. um, what did you see as the number one uh, concern? Um, communication. 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 At what levels? 
Because you know, there are all kinds of levels. All okay. levels. All levels. All levels. I mean, from parent to teach, you know, it, at all levels, communication mm -hmm. is definitely an issue. Resources are a different issue. Okay. okay. Um, knowing the process is another issue. Mm -hmm. okay. And those are issues that we can address. What okay. is the process? The, well, the process, okay, like, let's say, for instance, um, you know, basically the rules and regulations of what goes on in a daily school day, okay, mm -hmm. a lot of parents don't know that because they haven't been through that in the Latino community, mm. okay? They, if they didn't go to school or they came from a different country, they don't know what the rules are here, what they're allowed to do, not allowed to do. Okay. Tony, I'm not going to lie. I, at, at my age, I don't know the rules. Yeah. If I had to raise grandchildren, which is the, the, the plight of many grandparents today, mm -hmm. I don't know the rules. You Most know. people don't know the internal operations of a school. Yeah, and it's important because let's say you have a son or daughter okay, mm -hmm. that is eligible to take an AP class. They should do it. Okay, an advanced placement right. class because if they take that advanced placement class when they go on to college, that's going to save them nine semester hours. Tell you me know, about it. I was, that'll save I took you probably, all eight. That'll save I, you five to ten thousand dollars. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Another thing yeah. is we have kids that, um, for instance, a couple of those kids that come here, they want to go to school, okay, mm -hmm. um, and they're discouraged from taking the ACT, okay, and you can't get in college unless you take one of those tests, okay. Okay. Those are the kind of issues that I got it. We have to. But address. who would discourage a child from taking oh. the ACT, Tony? Oh, there are many people out there. Based on what? They just say, "Well, you're, you'll never go to college. You'll never do this. Never do that." I mean, I was told that when I was growing up. Tony, I was told that too. Exactly. But, but, but. But you know, until I didn't know we were still dealing with these oh, kind yes. of things. Tony, come oh, yeah. on. If it I wasn't, mean, this if is it disgusting. wasn't for, if it wasn't Sir Saul Torres when I was growing up, okay. I would have never gone to college. I'd never be, I never, would never be right here now as I am. That okay. is absolutely. And how many more? But we're are a little further like along, Tony. I mean, think. come on now. You would think, but we it's would not. think. It's mm. not. It's not. That is very, very. You know, and the other thing though, too is okay. <laughs> when you get, a, let's stay and talk about college. Yes. Okay? When you get a student in a college, okay. And they've never been there. They have nobody to guide them. If there's no infrastructure at that college to get them through those that process, okay, they get lost. They drop out. Okay? So is affirmative so action work, relevant today? Um, is that it, passe? It's not, or? It's, it's not so much affirmative action. It's mm -hmm. basically um, getting them, getting that kid through the first couple semesters. Okay. okay? Um, mentoring maybe. Hooked, mentoring, getting them okay. hooked in. Okay. But it also have like I told you when I went to Bowling Green. What kept me there was the Latino advisors that I had there, mm -hmm. okay, and and the group of Latino friends that we had. There. Okay, we had each other, okay, right? Because we were into an environment where we were completely different than anybody else that was there. Okay, we didn't get asked to rush in the fraternity the frater sororities. I know that's so we right. Had to, we had to form our <laughs> own little group. Yes, and that was our Latino student group. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, that is but that so was our powerful. group. That was our supportive group. Okay. Um, that we were able to help each other out. You know, it's so funny. It's not funny in a humorous way. It's funny in an ironic way that we're having a conversation because I went to a very elite women's college. Uh, my high school, I went to the top high school in Cincinnati, Ohio, Walnut Hills High School. Uh, a handful of African Americans at that time. I graduated with honors and my counselor told me that I needed to be a secretary or a typist. I had good typing skills and I said I wanted to be a scientist. And she thought that was hilarious. Nonetheless, uh, I went on and I was accepted into um, uh, one of the top women's colleges and found myself on campus with only a tiny group of African American women. And out of necessity, we bonded. No sororities, no dating, none of the things that would constitute a normal college experience, but uh, phenomenal educational experience. But I understand what you're saying about um, finding affinities with those who have your same experience. Mm -hmm. But I just thought, and again, this is like rapid speed forward, as we move forward, 
is this going to always be ne necessary? Are, are your children going to have to have the same experiences? Or will they be able to interface with the general culture at large, or what we define as the culture at large? Will they be able to make that transition? I think it happens more with first generation. OK. OK. Because, you know, once You're probably mo right. most mm -hmm. of the kids, that once they get into second and third generation, okay, yes. if they've had some guidance, they get over that. OK. Okay, like both my daughters, they both have master's degrees. Okay. Or have master's degrees, okay? Um, you know, all of us have master's degrees in our family. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, in my, my first growing generation, up, first right. generation, you know, I was the third in the family, uh, third oldest, but I was the first to graduate from high school. My words. You know, neither one of my parents graduated from. Right, right. Elementary school. Right. And so. I would suspect that that's probably the case with all first generations, mm -hmm. when they came over as immigrants from Europe, yeah. they they worked street work, factory, whatever they could do yeah. to make ends meet. But you know, if they stay, if they it can extend to second and third generation, if they stay in their communities, are not exposed to things ah, outside of that. Ah, exposure. Exactly. Exposure. You know, another program that I'm working with the university now yes. is trying to create some partnerships, internships in Central and South America. Because, Wonderful. Okay, if you got kids that Are you go talking through like the Brazil system, and Argentina and those yeah, areas, okay. Panama, yeah. Costa mm -hmm. Rica, okay. and those areas. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. okay. if you have kids that only been exposed to what's here, okay, right, and can't afford to go somewhere there, but if you create something, a partnership with a company there, mm -hmm. and get those kids there, they get exposed, okay, get the experience that they wouldn't otherwise get. That is absolutely. And that's another that's project so that insightful, mm -hmm. because I do believe it's exposure. It exposure is. Exposure change. Now, do you have any kinds of um, relationships where children that are in those countries get a chance to come into the United That'll States? That'll be what I. Is it cross cultural? Basically, trying to create a pipeline. Th that where, would be wherever, great. Wherever I'm at, mm -hmm. you know, when I, as I, these future years, wherever I'm at, that's when a major goes is create that pipeline. That will be transformational on both sides. On both sides. On both sides. On both sides. Yes, I you know, like and that. And then also, try, like you know, I'm talking about being, being innovative, okay? Like last week, I spoke to two engineers from the base, okay? Okay. Um, and they wanted to do a baseball academy tied to engineering. A okay? baseball academy yeah, tied when, to you know, engineering. Yeah, but, but it has to basically kids, okay. okay, to be part of this academy, but they also have, there has to be an academic component to it as well. Okay. Okay. But we also, I believe, it just can't just be baseball. It has to be softball, too. I believe you have to have both genders. Mm -hmm. okay. Females as well. Females as well. Mm -hmm. So some kind of a sports academy, okay, but tied to academics, okay? Mm. Whereas, you know, we got a lot of, you know, at the Wright Pat Air Force Base, we get the highest number of Latinos with advanced degrees in anywhere else in the state of Ohio. What? At yes. Wright Patterson at Wright -Pat. Air Force Base? And these guys want to get involved. They want Tony, to tutor these kids. That is amazing. You know, these are they're engineers. They're yes. Former baseball players. They want to give back. So we. We're, oh my that's word. Some, that's just a conversation we had last week, and we're going to talk about it again probably this afternoon about it. Oh, I think that's going to be yeah. fantastic. Again, you think in innovative ways to get kids. So you're going to involved. connect the sports connect component. Connect the sport and also connect the engineering. And then engineering, which is. Uh, vital. Exactly. That's back to that science, technology, engineering, mm -hmm. and math. Well, you tie them both. That you tie them both together. Mm -hmm. Oh, that is. Fu but and I'm that, looking at the right path. That's a whole oh. fertile field of, oh, of minds. It is. I mean, right, right here in exactly. the state of Ohio. Oh yeah, that's what I really like about Dayton, Ohio. The Welcome Dayton Initiative. Okay. Uh -huh. They want people to move here. They're not trying to force people out of here. They want people to move here, okay, and be part of something, okay? But Just I like the Wright Brothers is, is yeah, innovation. Yeah, but I'm telling you, innovation. Um, that airplane mindset where everybody can fly. Exactly. And that Dayton, meaning day town, new day, yes. new town, day town. Yeah. I think that's, uh, that, that speaks very highly of your community. Mm -hmm. I have to say that. And I must yeah. say this that I have felt from day one when I started uh, coming up here to, to uh, uh, do this show, there is such a spirit up here of um, innovation and creativity. Mm -hmm. And people drive through Dayton on their way to Detroit. I mean, you whiz through Dayton, you don't think about Dayton. Oh, yeah. But um, 
I must say that what you're sharing with me and the attitude about inclusion of the Latino community is um, a feather in the hat of the community here. Mm -hmm. That they are not trying to isolate them or to exclude them, but actually to embrace them. Yes. Now, have you found that there is a openness in terms of cultural exchange? For, oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, most people that we come in contact with, they want to help. They mm -hmm. want to say, how can you help you? How can we help you? You know, for instance, like in El Puente, okay? Um, we had a kid that had special needs. Okay. okay? I went back to a meeting in, um, at the university, and uh, we were just talking, and I was explaining about this kid to the, these other people mm -hmm. there. And the lady that's in charge of special education says, I'll come out and tutor. So she comes out once a week to tutor this kid. And she just volunteers. Just volunteer. Just volunteer. Yeah, just volunteer. This lady is super busy. I, like most yeah. and, but she talented says, people She says, I want to help that kid. So and she, she made that personal out, yeah. commitment to she help him. That com yeah. Or her. That, that, is, that mm -hmm. says a lot. Yeah. That you know, really like uh, another another uh, another great program that we started like three summers ago is you know I'm sitting in I'm a part of the curriculum committee in the College okay. of Education, okay, and we were talking about um, there was this program that they had at another school for the summer. These okay. are intervention specialists, okay. They lost their home. They were oh. where they were supposed to be. They were mm -hmm. at another school system. The school then couldn't accommodate them anymore. And I said I'll take them, okay. So these are thirty. Uh, intervention specialists that come out for 10 sessions in the summer with these kids one-on-one. -on -one, okay? Every one of those kids, all 30 of those kids for the last three summers have increased reading level at least by one and math level at least by one. Because of the... Again, I was at, a, I was at the right place at the right time. Yes. I says, okay, yes. <laughs> I, we, we can use this. You know, I went back yes. to sister and sister said, you know, we were, she was just in the process of moving. She said, you're crazy. I said, well, if we don't take this now, we're not going to get an right. opportunity. <laughs> so it worked. So you have to be extremely proactive yourself. Oh, yes. Back I'm to always, that leader yeah, again. Yeah. Somebody's got to lead. I'm never going to be rich. I know that. But I, I know uh, I know that's that That's definitionally. I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, seriously. That's so definitional. So I, I know that if I see an opportunity, I'm going, the worst, if I don't ask, the worst thing you can say is. Is no. No. Exactly. So. But I would have to say that most people of good heart would say yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they can help. Most people will help. They would yeah. help. Oh, yeah. Yes. That is so wonderful. So where do you see um, this entire movement going? You know, there's uh, more and more um, being done. Okay. okay. And on behalf of, you know, like tomorrow, um, there's like 10 of us going to be meeting with the Ohio Attorney General. Mm -hmm. He's asked us to come just talk to him. There's more and more conversations that are occurring. Okay. okay. Like the, the Latino Dream Team. You know, yes. We've spoken to uh, Turner, Representative Turner. We've spoken to Turn, um, uh, Rob Portman. Okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. We've spoken to the, the chair of the Republican Party, the chair of the Democratic Party. We've spoken to um, the HUD, Assistant Secretary of HUD. Mm -hmm. All these people have come in and talked to us. Okay. And we express our concerns and then we come up with solutions. Okay. We come up with them. Um, opportunities that we, that most of us didn't even thought of that could have occurred, but they are occurring. Well, give, if you don't mind, for those that would want, and, and for those of you that are watching the show that would like to be a part of this exciting piece, and it is exciting, it's making me happy, mm -hmm. uh, why don't you give them your phone number so they can call you? I just moved into a new <laughs> office. <Okay. laughs> I just moved into a okay. new office. I don't remember my new number. but. Um, my e email is the best okay, way to get Okay, that's fine. Of. Email. Yep. Okay, what it's is your email? Tony, T O N Y, uh -huh. dot O R T I Z, okay. at right dot edu. Okay, Tony, okay. dot O R T I Z, at right, right W R I G H T, dot edu. Dot edu. Yep. And if they have skill sets or just want to be a part of, oh, they just want to of be, the worker bees, as yeah, I said, the, the wanna, hive doesn't get built without worker bees. If they want to be connected to something in the Latino community, whether it's in Dayton, Ohio, whether it's anywhere in Ohio, mm -hmm. I can get them connected. Oh, that is wonderful. Well, you know I got to call Cincinnati. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, uh, that's oh, my yeah. hometown. I got I to gotta do yeah. Cincinnati. But this is exciting. And so uh, let me ask you, um, 
as you look, and I don't know enough to speak on this correctly, but within the Latino community, are the girls on parity with the boys in terms of the academics and the, their their uh, their uh, future? If I have anything to do with it, yes. Because you two have two daughters. daughters. Yes. I was going <laughs> to say, daughters, you got yes. two daughters. Oh, yes. So I know that. Yes. When somebody brings a program to me, I'm looking at it also from you know, both genders. And if it's just one gender, I'm not going to do it. Okay. So uh, it has to be gender it has neutral. It has to be gender neutral. Okay. And, you know, in all our programs, too, you know, they're set up for Latinas, but if they're if some family brings me a kid that they need help with, mm -hmm. we're not going to turn them away. Right, right. Well, I would think that some of the things that you all are uh, discovering within your own community has mm -hmm. great um, application oh, yes. to others as well, mm -hmm. wouldn't you say? Yeah, a best practice is a best practice That's what for I'm anybody. thinking. Yeah. It, it applies to all persons. Yeah. I am just concerned, Tony, that our country is not going to make it unless we have forward-thinking people in the era of education because you can't talk about with all these cutbacks and uh, we're in the midst of sequestering and that's 85 billion dollars and then mm -hmm. the budget is not balanced and revenues aren't coming in and on and on and on and they keep talking about education on the block not wanting to underwrite and support do you see a future that would probably be just volunteerism and and community, or do you see the government playing a lesser and lesser role in defining how education is going to look? The key is the parents. The parents. Parents are the key. Okay, I mean, you can have the best system in the world. Okay, okay. But if the parents don't make them go there, and make them accountable for what they're doing. Okay, it's not going to happen. The parents hold the keys. Well, then I have to throw this out in the remaining time. Mm -hmm. Since 70% of children today, I think that number has been bantered around, are being raised by single parent homes. Mm -hmm. And these are people that are not middle income, they're struggling, they're poor, they're trying to make ends meet. What is their future? And it's the same. I mean, ba basically, if you, have a, if you have a kid, single uh -huh. parent or two parents, okay. okay. Um, you just turn that TV off, turn that computer off, make them do their work, take them to the library, make them read, okay? Anything the library's that they free read. in America. Yeah. Amazing. Um, get them involved in as much and many activities as possible, mm -hmm. okay? Not all sports, okay? Mm -hmm. but but sports them, is good, though. Sports is good, but, you know, and I've mm -hmm. lived my child, life in sports, yes, but right. not every kid wants to be an right. athlete. Right, okay? that's true. Find what their interest is and keep them involved, okay? okay? And all the universities, all the schools have programs. And unfortunately, a lot of these programs, they're not well attended. Because? Yeah. They, there's not, the interest is not there, or maybe communication is not there, too. I think it's Are a little bit Are these free programs? There's a lot of free programs. Oh, my goodness. You know, now, I, I you, know, you go to the library and you go to your YMCA's yes. and all those, YWCA's, all of them have programs, okay? They're this out is there. so good. They're out there. All you have to do is get involved. Okay. This is so good. You know, you have to turn that TV off, turn that computer off, okay? Uh, no them, Xbox. No Xbox, you know, get them mm -hmm. involved. Okay, the more people they meet, the more experiences that they have. They engage in, mm -hmm. okay, the more rounded they're going to be. Okay? That is so if a kid can read and they can write, they can do anything they want to do. I'm with you, Tony. You know? I believe that. I believe that there's unlimited potential among our children. Mm hmm I really do, and that we have to be willing to see it and to harness it. Mm -hmm. They are our future. Exactly. The, and, and, and what a great future we have if we're willing to invest in our future. Mm -hmm. And on that note, viewers, hasn't this been a great show? And hopefully you've learned some things. And uh, you are a Tony Ortez supporter, because I am. And on this note, I'm going to close out today's segment of The Power of Money. Thank you so much for listening in and watching and being a part of my world. And look forward to seeing you again. And as always, you take care and God bless.